Although it might not be immediately obvious to distant observers, Australia had a thriving aviation industry during the Cold War. Having understood the risks of their geographically isolated position in the 1930s, Australia had taken its first tentative steps in military aircraft manufacture by license producing North American NA-16 trainers as the Commonwealth Aircraft Corporation Wirraway. Although the Wirraway will not go down in history as a prolific killer of other aircraft, over the coming years, DAP and CAC built Beaufort, Bowfighter and Lincoln bombers, Boomerang and Mustang fighters to supply Australian requirements. These were variously produced from imported parts, knockdown kits and locally manufactured elements. The RAAF's intention as the jet age dawned was to acquire a fleet of Gloucester Meteors and, as it happens, they were gifted a Mark III as a kind of combat aircraft taster by the British government in 1946. They liked what they saw, but demand for the Meteor on the export market meant that these aircraft didn't materialise in the 1940s, so the first widely available jet fighter in Australian service was the humble de Havilland Vampire. 190 of these were manufactured by de Havilland Australia from 1949 to 1960. Despite some enviable characteristics, the Vampire was one of the least capable early jet fighters. It couldn't be sent to Korea because it was too vulnerable to MiGs and ground fire. Although the Meteor F-8 was certainly a better performer, it too was effectively obsolete by the late 1940s. The emergence of the MiG-15 a year or so later would stamp out any ideas that the Meteor remained a frontline air superiority fighter. But that moment of realisation was some time in the future. So, as the first vampires were entering squadron service, the RAAF started the search for its successor. This was a rather circuitous process that allowed all corners of the 1950s Australian political spectrum to be variously happy, and unhappy. Australia's initial choice appears to have been between two rather diverse aircraft. One was the Grumman Panther, a rugged, single-seat, straight-winged carrier fighter powered by a license-produced Rolls-Royce Neen. The other was a rather ambitious, domestically designed aircraft by CAC called CA-23. CA-23 was proposed as a two-seat, twin-engined aircraft with a delta wing. With more than 12,000 pounds of thrust on tap, it was intended to be capable of Mach 1.5 and a 17,000 feet per minute climb rate. Since there was no chance of this idea succeeding, common sense prevailed for a moment and CA-23 was cancelled in February 1950. Never to be dissuaded from a bad idea, though, the Australian government then decided to order 72 Hawker P-1081 fighters. P-1081 is actually quite a sad story of lack of ambition in the British aircraft establishment. Sparing you the full story at this moment, P-1081 was an offshoot of the Hawker Seahawk and a kind of evolutionary bridge between that plane and the later Hunter. Although there's more to it than this, it can be thought of as a Seahawk fitted with a swept wing and tail surfaces. It would likely have been a good early 1950s fighter if the British government and RAF had actually supported it. But they didn't, and the Australian government was very slow to realise that they were the only customer for a relatively complicated aircraft development programme taking place on the other side of the world. Hawker cancelled it at the end of 1950, ironically through worry about Australian commitment. Eighteen months after they'd started their procurement programme, the Australians were back at square one. Their first move was to request Meteor F-8s, which were sent to fight in Korea. They had wanted Sabres, but North American were struggling to keep up with demand and there was a strong pro-British anti-American lobby within the Australian government of the time. Everyone liked the sound of the Hawker Hunter, which actually did have support from the British government and looked to be a bit of a winner. But its development was slow and in the end it wouldn't be operational until 1954. The whole situation was developing into a crisis. 
Fortunately for Australia, it had Lawrence Wackett. Born in Townsville in 1896, Wackett was one of Australia's first pilots during World War I, fighting both in the Dardanelles and over the Western Front. After that conflict, he was one of the 21 officers that formed the RAAF and then spent much of the interwar period trying to build aircraft within that service, irritating the British, and eventually going off and building his own planes and boats. Just as war beckoned, he became the general manager of the Commonwealth Aircraft Corporation when they acquired his business. Wackett had followed the aircraft procurement debacle and decided that his compatriots were simply making the wrong decision. He therefore went off to North American Aviation and got agreement in principle to build the Sabre under license. His personal relationship with the company was strong. After all, CAC had built nearly a thousand Wiraways and Mustangs under license. He then went to Ernest Hives, the chairman of Rolls-Royce, about getting his hands on a more powerful engine to fit into the Sabre. Having got everyone's approval, he took his plan to the chief of the air staff, received a rebuke for not doing things with official approval, and then congratulations for identifying the right fighter for Australia's needs. A quick call from Ernest Hives, Lord Hives to give him his proper title, to the new Minister for Air to smooth over any political issues with an American fighter, and the deal was done. In truth, Wackett's solution was both practical and elegant. The Sabre was the best fighter of its day. Fitting a new engine would give it more longevity and respond to feedback from pilots in Korea than it needed a bit more go. The Rolls-Royce Avon was also the engine used by the English electric Canberras that Australia was buying, simplifying maintenance and ground crew training. The other obvious change was to the armament. Out went machine guns and in went cannons. The result was probably the most capable Sabre variant, but we'll examine that possibility in a little while. The Australian Sabre was based on the slatted wing F-86F Sabre. That meant that it had the standard length wing with full leading edge slats for reduced stall speed and improved low speed handling. The J-47 in the F-86F gave around £6,000 of thrust. Replacing this with the Avon initially increased power to £7,500 in an engine that weighed £300 less than the original. Packaging the Sabre to accommodate it was not trivial as the Avon was shorter than the J47 and required 25% more airflow. To preserve the centre of gravity, the engine was moved further back in the fuselage. More changes were needed to deal with the engine accessories. On the J-47, these were attached to the front frame of the engine itself. The Avon wasn't constructed like this, and things like the fuel pump, engine control unit, and hydraulic pumps needed to be positioned away from the engine in a more temperature-controlled location. In the Avon Sabre, this meant mounting them ahead of the firewall and providing cooling through three ducts, one beneath the fuselage and one on either side. Two more ducts were added in the engine bay to keep the bulkhead sufficiently cool. Moving the engine accessories meant slightly reducing the size of the fuel cells from 352 mighty imperial gallons. That's 422.7 of your feeble US gallons, or 1600 litres if you don't fancy sparking an international incident over liquid volume measurement standards. The F-86F has 437 US gallons of internal capacity so we're talking about a 3% reduction. The final engine-related change was to add a small tank of Plessy Propyl Nitrate starter, sufficient for three engine starts in the absence of external electrical power. This was an emergency measure, and as I understand it, was rarely used in practice. As with all Sabres, engine access was still affected by removing the rear fuselage. To increase airflow into the engine, the front fuselage was deepened by 3.7 inches between the point immediately behind the intake lip to just aft of the cockpit. It's a subtle change compared to what North American had to do in the Sabre Hog, but it contributed to a process of redesign that would ultimately alter 60% of the Sabre's fuselage structure. Fitting cannons definitely contributed to these modifications. More firepower was top of the list for US pilots engaged in Korea, 
From December of 1952, the Gunval Project evaluated M39 20mm cannons on Sabres fighting in Korea. My view is that Gunval itself was pretty inconclusive. The modified Sabres struggled with gun gas ingestion and two aircraft were thus lost to stalls. The cannons did have increased lethality, but with only 100 rounds per gun there was only enough ammunition for four seconds of firing. The Avon Sabre was well into its development journey by this point, and the team had already begun to encounter similar issues. The Australian Sabres differed considerably from the Gunval Sabres or Sabre Hogs in their choice of weapons. A quad 20mm Hispano Suiza battery had been considered as it formed the standard weapons arrangement of British fighters at the time. But the RAF was in the process of moving to an even more powerful arrangement. Like the French with their DIFA, Britain had come into possession of plans for, and working examples of, the Mauser MG213C revolver cannon. They put it into production as the 30mm Aden gun. The Aden had a cyclic rate of between 1200 and 1500 rounds a minute. Once fired, the shells weighed 220 grams and travelled at 2700 feet per second. That's double the weight of a 20mm shell from the M39, so the two Aidens put as much shell weight on target as four M39s. The guns were mounted, inverted, in the existing gun bay. In order to simplify ammunition feed, they were staggered, so that the starboard gun was 20cm forward of the port gun. This arrangement straightened out the feed, which was electrical. The arrangement appears to have been more successful than the four-gun setup on the M39 equipped F86H, which remained a source of trouble throughout its service life. In general, the Aden was more reliable than the M39, which likely also helped matters. There was capacity for 162 rounds per gun, but typically only 150 rounds per gun were carried. As in Gunval, the North American and CAC engineers experimented with numerous combinations of gun gas venting from the gun compartment and blast panel configurations, without ever succeeding in completely eliminating stalling. In the end, the best solution was to modify the engine control system so that it automatically dipped fuel supply at the moment of firing. From 1959, the Sabre would also receive air-to-air missile capability to supplement the cannons. Two weapons were evaluated, the AIM-9B Sidewinder and the de Havilland Firestreak. Firestreak testing began in early 1956 and went on for well over a year. The British missile isn't particularly well understood or well regarded, not helped today by an inaccurate Wikipedia page. What is true is that it was a complicated weapon in the mode of the AIM-4 Falcon rather than one of elegant simplicity like the Sidewinder. It featured an externally cooled seeker that offered better detection performance than either of the US missiles. Like the Falcon, it could be cued by a radar steer via the aircraft's fire control system. Once fired, it had a range of 4 miles, double that of Sidewinder, and it got there at Mach 3 plus the speed of the launching aircraft, again substantially faster than early Sidewinder. Almost all of these advanced capabilities were hard or impossible to use on the Sabre, however. The proposed solution was to carry the fire control electronics in a blister pod on the Sabre's centre line. If Firestreak had ultimately been selected for service, then there was talk of fitting a proper radar and the MG4 fire control computer from the F-86K to make the most of its features. This would have led to extensive reworking. Ultimately, the cost significantly outweighed the benefits and the idea was abandoned leading to Australia signing up for Sidewinders in 1959, having first investigated the idea in 1956. Fitment was easy. The Sabre carried a pair of missiles, one on each of the inboard wing pylons. Unfortunately, 93 of 111 Avon Sabres had already been delivered by this point, but I understand that all of them were eventually modified to fire Sidewinder. Part of that modification related to the fuel dipper, which would reduce engine RPM by 300 for a moment while the sidewinder cleared the aircraft. This prevented engine compressor surge as the missile hurtled past the engine intake, sending a shockwave down the pipe and into the engine. Remarkably, I've got to this point in a video about the F-86 without talking about wings. 
Well, fear not, here's a little bit of wing chat for you. The Avon Sable was built in three versions. The first batch were 22 Mark 30s delivered between August 1954 and July 1955. These had the original Sabre slatted wing and were powered by Rolls-Royce built Avons assembled in Australia from knockdown kits. There followed the Mark 31, another 20 aircraft arriving between July 1955 and September 1956. Production rate was hardly at the mass level. The Mark 31 had the 6-3 wing from the F-25 Sabre, which had a fixed leading edge and was slightly extended at the root and tip. Half of these aircraft were delivered with UK-built engines, the remainder were powered by Australian license-built examples. The definitive Australian Sabre was the Mark 32. Although this version had an improved Avon that featured the aforementioned fuel dipper to combat gun gas ingestion issues, the biggest change was really in the wings. These were upgraded to the dual store wing found on the F-35 Sabre. Since in US service this was intended as a nuclear strike aircraft, it featured two hard points per wing and each was rated to carry a thousand pounds of stores. CAC modified it to include a small leading edge fuel tank, increasing total fuel capacity to a mighty 412 imperial gallons. That's nearly 14% more than in the F-86F and thus makes the Avon Sabre one of the longest ranged of all Sabres. Only the Hog carried more fuel, and it was larger and heavier aircraft all round. 69 Mark 32s were made between September 1956 and December 1961. The first Mark 30s cost 680,000 US dollars. The last Mark 32s were 1.05 million. That is pretty expensive, to be honest. A factory fresh F 86F cost the USAF $225,000 at 1955 prices. No doubt the Avon was the superior machine, but probably not three times superior. By the time we get to the late 1950s, an F 100D Super Sabre could be had for about $700,000. Lockheed also tried to persuade the Australians to take Starfighters, which were a million dollar Mach 2 aircraft. That's what a million a copy got you in 1957. But Australia persisted with the Sabre. Many Australian pilots likely lived to tell the tale because of that decision. To fly, the Avon Sabre was basically a Sabre with more punch. A pilot's aircraft, it had all of the docility and pliability of the original in that it communicated the limits clearly and recovered easily upon departure. The structure was immensely strong. The RAAF only succeeded in breaking the static test article they were using to examine the limits of the airframe's strength by subjecting it to the equivalent of an 18G pullout. That's 18G on an airframe officially only rated to 7G below 15,000 feet and 6G above it. All round visibility was exceptional. The avionics were simple to use and reliable, and the cockpit was roomy and logically laid out. Rolls-Royce's Avon was one of the most trustworthy power units of the era, and significant engine failures were uncommon. What the Avon Sabre had that the Sabre didn't was a glut of power. It was a 700 mile an hour fighter that was more limited by the transonic aerodynamics of the design rather than ultimate power. Rate of climb was 30% faster than the F-86 F-40 at 12,000 feet per minute, despite being a few hundred pounds heavier than the US aircraft. Service ceiling was 52,000 feet, with some pilots managing to get it up to 55,000. It also had exceptional firepower, which from the Mark 32 onwards could be consistently deployed without issue. Sadly for those of us who love to compare aircraft, we never saw what the Avon Sabre could do in action. It arrived much too late to serve in Korea. It deployed during the Malayan emergency to drop bombs on unoccupied bits of jungle, carrying sidewinders on some missions in case of Chinese intervention. In the 1960s, it flew on the fringes of the war in Vietnam, based at Ubon and patrolling along the Thailand-Lao border. But no scuffles with MiGs occurred. Because Avon Sabres never deployed to Europe, 
and thus never got into impromptu fights with neighbouring squadrons, it lacks the fearsome reputation enjoyed by the Canadian Mark VI. But in truth, the Avon was probably the superior aircraft as an out-and-out dogfighter due to its better aerodynamics and vastly superior firepower. I'm not sure if anyone has ever put them head-to-head, so the matchup is now purely one for the hypothetical. The Avon Sabre was only really intended as a 10-year fighter. The RAAF wasn't naive to the fact that by the time it entered service it had been rendered somewhat obsolete by supersonic fighters appearing elsewhere. They were either lucky or prescient in realising that for local defence, an agile, heavily armed and reliable fighter would actually be more than a match for an early supersonic attacker. That said, tactics development was required. In April 1957, the RAAF staged a major exercise which involved vampires and Canberras playing an opposing force attacking Sydney. The initial phases of the exercise were an embarrassment. The Sabres were slow to get airborne in the estimation of the umpires, albeit I would say that 65 seconds to wheels up is actually pretty good. But the main problems were in coordination of ground control intercepts. Sabres weren't getting timely or accurate vectors and hence weren't getting to their targets quickly enough. Things did improve over the days of the exercise, but a modicum of realism returned on the last day. Having been told to fly straight and level at altitude, the Canberras switched to a more coordinated and realistic attack pattern. With one aircraft acting as a decoy, another penetrated the defences and successfully attacked its target before being intercepted all of which goes to show that technology really is only a part of the battle. Over the years, a number of proposals were made to upgrade the Sabres. In 1952, before the first aircraft had even reached service, an engine upgrade to the Avon RA-14 was mooted. This would have boosted thrust to £10,000, resulting in a 40% improvement in climbing performance and improved high-altitude manoeuvrability. Time to 50,000 feet would have dropped to 8 minutes, which would have been impressive for an aircraft without reheat. Turn radius at 35,000 feet would have been reduced by 11%. The trouble with this upgrade was that it required a still larger intake duct, relocation of the engine 10 inches further forward, and further structural strengthening to cope with greater forces. Having already redesigned the Sabre once, doing so again and taking more delays wasn't sensible they might as well have waited for the Hunter. In reality, the extra performance was really more of a feature at high altitudes. By the time the Avon Sabre was reaching squadrons, this mission type was becoming less of a focus as bombers were shifting to low-level attack. Another proposed upgrade of note was to replace the ANAPG-30 radar system with a NASAR set developed by North American. This offered search as well as ranging facilities, and I assume would have required a redesigned nose and forward fuselage. I've not been able to find many details of the proposal, so if anyone can shed light on it, I'd appreciate it. Air-to-air refuelling came up repeatedly during the Sabre's career in Australia. In April 1956, a probe and drogue system from Flight Refuelling Limited was proposed that enabled the underwing drop tanks to be refuelled in flight. In theory, this would have extended ferry range to over 2,700 miles, but for reasons lost to history, it was dropped, only to be revived in 1959 when the need to get Sabres to Malaysia emerged. But again, that plan came to nothing. In the end, the Sabres flew the 6,000 miles to Butterworth near Penang Island in a series of hops. 21 fighters departed late on October from Williamtown, of which two were spares. All 19 of the primary aircraft made it, and in all, 77 Sabres would serve in the Malayan emergency. Sabres continued as frontline fighters in the RAAF until the early 1970s. The last frontline squadron received their Mirages in 1971. Many of the remaining Sabres were gifted to Indonesia and Malaysia. Of the 111 Mark 30, 31 and 32 Sabres delivered to the RAAF, 27 crashed or were otherwise written off in Australian service. That's 25% of the fleet over a 15-year period, half of the course for a first-generation fighter. 
In the round, the Avon Sabre stands out as one of, if not the finest, realisation of North American's original design concept. It was an expensive aircraft for the time, but custom jobs always are. Given how long it took to set up local production, waiting for Hunter or Mystere would have meant waiting until the late 1950s for a swept-wing fighter. Going straight to a challenging aircraft like the Starfighter would have been foolhardy, in my view at least. So, money aside, the Avon Sabre deserves its place as one of the greats of early Cold War aviation. <laughs>